Hey folks, welcome to another one of our Becoming events. A big thank you to everyone for uh, coming out tonight and for joining us on another one of our virtual webinars. I know there's so many things online right now, so many different ways to spend an evening that I really, really appreciate folks coming out and having an interest in everything energy efficiency. So thanks for coming on by. This is a series where we come together to learn about all of the different careers in energy efficiency. We're very, very grateful to the two sponsors that make these events possible, and that's Natural Resources Canada and Electricity Human Resources Canada. Both are sponsors who are really key in growing the Canadian energy efficiency workforce, and we wouldn't be able to do all of this work without them. The Becoming series is where we meet leaders in the sector and we hear their stories of how they got started, what kind of skills are important if you want a role like theirs, and any advice that they have for people looking to follow in their footsteps. So just as we get started today, if there's anything that you need to do to settle into the call, if you want to grab a snack, some water, do a stretch, find somewhere new in your house to settle in, I encourage you to do that now. You've got a few minutes before we really kick things off. I also want to start this event with a land acknowledgement. Land acknowledgements are something that shouldn't just be done out of habit, but something that we do with a really clear intention. We want to position ourselves and to provide meaningful and thankful acknowledgement to the Inuit, First Nations, and Métis communities whose land we occupy. So I want to acknowledge that I currently live, gather, work, and organize on the traditional and unceded territories of the Algonquin Nation. And I also want to acknowledge how I, as a settler, still benefit from the systems of injustice that Canada upholds. So if it feels right to you, please feel encouraged to share your own thoughts, land acknowledgements, and ideas in the chat. I also want to let everyone know that after the event, you can join us on something called the Discover EE Hub. So it's an online portal full of courses, jobs, events, all kinds of information to make it easy to thrive in energy efficiency careers. You can join a specific role if you want to be part of the community around that role. So after today's event, all you would need to do is go to the website, click on the policy analyst role and click join. You'll find all kinds of training courses. You'll get to hear from people who are already in that role. You can even jump into a virtual campfire to get to know some new people in the sector. So that's all set up to make it really easy for you to launch into an energy efficiency career. And my last notes for tonight, we are going to be recording tonight's event as usual, so you will be able to go back and review anything that you miss. We have a hard cutoff time at 545 Eastern, and I'm going to start by asking some of my own questions, and then the last half of the event, we're going to turn to our audience for some Q&A. So if you have any of your own questions about what's the right path forward, any skills, any expertise that you're looking for, you can put those questions into the Q&A, which is at the bottom of your screen. Uh, you'll also be able to raise your hand during our Q&A section, your virtual Zoom hand, and I can unmute you to ask your question directly and out loud. So start to drop those in at any time. This week's speaker is Heather Simotuk. Heather is currently a manager in the government of Yukon's energy branch. Prior to joining the government of Yukon, Heather worked at Natural Resources Canada and the Smart Pro Prosperity Institute. Heather holds a Master's of Science in Environmental Governance from the University of Oxford. Very cool. And tonight we're going to try a bit of a new format. So Heather, I'm going to start just by asking you my first question, which is, how did you get started in this career? What is it? The, what was the first step and, and how did you begin? So potentially, like a lot of people on this call, I sort of graduated with a degree that I was like really interested in. I had taken courses in, in energy, but you know, didn't, wasn't exactly sure where um, I was going to find a job and, and, and what that would actually be in. I kind of ended up in Ottawa, moving back from the UK, which, which worked out well for sort of a policy job. Initially, I thought that I would work in for a municipality and be involved in sort of municipal green, green programs or doing other sorts of programming within a city. Ended up just kind of a, applying to a bunch of different things. And what really got me started in, in sort of the, more of the policy world was that internship with the Smart Prosperity Institute. And they had an opening for a policy analyst focused on municipal municipal type work. And so it was a, it was a really good fit and kind of lucked out. And that was what started me off. Yeah, it really is sometimes just that first break that will get you that started on that path. And so related to that, and it, it might be the same answer, but did you have any really defining moments or an aha moment that led you to the current role that you're in now? Mm -hmm. So you already kind of mentioned 
started off with Smart, Smart Prosperity Institute and then, and then worked at Natural Resources Canada. But when I was working for Natural Resources Canada, I had an opportunity to travel to Alaska for a conference. I was in Fairbanks and I met some of my now colleagues and um, I was saying how much I enjoyed Alaska, how much I, how beautiful I thought it was. And their response was, well, if you like Alaska, you'll love the Yukon. <laughs> and so, but that, that trip was really, um, an aha moment for me because I was working on a, a program that was supporting renewable energy, uh, projects in the North, but hadn't been really to the North of Canada. And so going to Alaska was, was the first time and just really enjoyed the people. I felt the challenges were really tangible and the policy so working in government and policy, sometimes you feel removed from what's happening for people in, in every day-to-day -day world. And you're sort of working on these, these structures and you're sort of reporting and writing documents for, for things that may or may not get picked up. And it's hard to see the role you play, but I felt that that was very, very visible when you were working for a government up in the North. So I started watching job postings for the government of Yukon. And when one showed up in the energy space, I applied and that's kind of what brought me specifically to this role. That's very cool. It's cool that you were able to meet some of your coworkers before you even, you know, before you even knew that was where you were headed. And that was what really helped making me feel like I would, um, enjoy the role that I would, that I kind of knew what I was getting into because I moved up here without ever having been to Whitehorse. So it was good to, to chat with people beforehand. That's a big move. And so, you know, applying for the job is great, but you need some skills to be able to land that job and then succeed in that job. So what kind of skills do you think someone needs to really excel in your role? Yeah. So I think one of the, one of the things that's drilled into you over post-secondary is strong writing skills. So definitely in the, in a policy type job, um, energy policy, but really just policy generally, you're, you're writing a lot and you're expected to write documents very quickly because they probably have a short turnaround. So being pretty, pretty confident and being able to clearly articulate uh, what you're working on and, and why is, is I, th I think paramount. But then from that, there's a whole lot of other sort of soft skills that I think are probably more required than, yeah, they're just maybe, maybe even equivalent to, to sort of the interest in the subject matter. And so that's like good problem solving skills. There's really not one right answer so or one path forward so you're working through a sort of murky or unclear situation to kind of propose a path forward that relies on like really strong judgment to know yeah to trust what what the policy priorities of the government are how to sort of advance their aims what people what people are looking for what what the citizens are sort of looking for and, and being able to kind of take a lot of those opinions and then create create the the next steps or propose programs or or changes to the existing policy structure so that those goals can be realized and then I think also an ability to, to multitask. So you're never working on, on just one thing or even a few things. There's, there's multiple, multiple things that are happening all at the same time. So you've got to be able to um, balance completing tasks and also seeking out sort of new tasks and not getting lost in the, in the urgent things, but keeping the, the big, the big important stuff moving forward too. And in a world where you've got a lot of different things happening all at the same time, you definitely yeah. I guess you also need to have like a bit of a thick skin. Some things are not going to go forward. Some things are going to drop off and other things you'll be surprised at how quickly they, they happen and how quickly they move. So definitely an ability to like bounce back when stuff um, doesn't go the way that you're, you're thinking it will and to quickly pivot, to be able to like drop things, to quickly respond to a challenge. And so being very sort of flexible in that way is, is I think a, an asset in, in government. Yeah, that's a great point. I find that the policy world can be, it's fun, but it definitely has, you don't always get that clear, you know, start to finish. We move from A to B in this linear process. It's a bit of a winding road that sometimes goes back exactly to where you started and mm -hmm. yeah, mm -hmm. it's unique. <laughs> For sure. And so what does it actually look like day to day? So, you, you know, let's give us a, a day in the life of Heather. 
Yeah, I when you when you were when we were talking about this question beforehand, I was maybe like maybe a week. A week is probably a good frame of reference. And sometimes I think it's actually quite similar to like a university, a university schedule, like an undergrad schedule. So in undergrad, you know, you've got your set lectures that you have to show up to. Maybe, maybe people on the call didn't always show up to all their lectures, but you know, theoretically you've got like lectures that you're, you're supposed to be at that kind of give you those little, I don't know, like grounding pieces. You've got like multiple different classes that all have different assignments, some deadlines that conflict, other things that don't, and then sort of ultimate, ultimate drop dead deadlines for your exams at the end. And I think that that actually um, <laughs> relates really well to government where you've got, so in my week, I've got like my routine check-ins with, with my team, with my manager, um, and then a couple of other teams that we work quite closely with. And so those sort of form the bedrock of my week. I know that those are, those are going to happen and we just keep everyone up to date and plan out. So we typically plan out next steps. We plan out goals for the week, what we want to get done, who's doing what, what, what problems are we seeing? What's, what's the path forward? And that can be for all the different initiatives that, that are happening. And so right, right now, I'll just kind of give like a, a range of what's happening. We're doing a legislative change. We're developing a new act. We're doing a regulatory change. We're doing a second regulatory change. We're setting a policy goal for the mining sector. So a greenhouse gas emission um, intensity target, doing research on that. We've got three different, two different research projects with different contractors of outside bodies. We've got our um, quarterly reporting that's happening. We're going to be responding to energy data from Energy Efficiency Canada, in addition to sort of random briefing notes, requests from the minister, or letters from the public that come in. So all of those things are kind of happening at any one given time, and we're doling out uh, work to different people with different deadlines to get it finished. So once those are sort of set over the week, I typically like block out time that I'm going to work on different things. And so I figure out what, what needs to be done this week, what can be done later, days that they have to be finished by and sort of structure the time around those meetings that I have to, to complete my writing or to complete my, my work. And then, you know, you just got to be nimble because there's going to be surprises that come up. So short-term requests that could be suddenly reviewing a minister's speech. It could be a change to briefing notes. It could be a request from another team asking for updated energy data or, yeah, or just other, other sort of meetings with stakeholders who get in touch with you. And so it's, it's about responding to all of those in as timely, sensitive manner as possible while, while still achieving your overall long-term goals. And so it's been now in, in my manager role, I'm helping my team, I guess, complete a lot of those tasks. And so my work on particular files has definitely decreased a bit, but yeah, it's, there's always, always something new. And a lot of times you're helping out colleagues and, and picking up projects when um, something needs to be done fast and, and people are, are in the midst of working on other things. So definitely a, a team environment where you're, you're, I don't want to say um, everyone has their area of expertise and, and focus, but certainly a willingness to to help out and learn about other other topics that other people are working on is 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 a strength in a teammate. Yeah, I'm I'm overwhelmed even just hearing that <laughs> list of projects. It, I feel like it'd be really fun to be working on so many files. Like it's nice to have something new all the time. Um, but it, do you ever find it difficult to keep up or is it just, you know, that's the kind of personality that comes into this role is being able to manage those multiple projects and, and deadlines? Yeah, I, when, when I started out, I definitely had my particular area of focus and I was working on, so when I, when I started at Natural Resources Canada, I was working on one particular funding program and I was working on one, one particular stream of that funding program. So it was pretty, pretty narrow. And I think I spent like months working on the documents that went, went out to the application guide and like scoping out the, the funding program stream. And that is, I think, maybe a more typical experience in like the government of Canada. You're, if you're working for a government of Canada team, you're going to have a, a much more narrow piece of what, what's happening. Definitely, I think that the variety of projects is increased by working through the government of Yukon, where our whole energy branch is about 25 people. And um, I'm on the sort of policy 
policy research um, and pilot side of things. And so we have a team of four. So in other jurisdictions, for example, you might have, you know, 20 people working on, you know, one working on just like alternative energy or, or, you know, we work on renewable fuels, but when we talk with people, the government of Alberta, you know, they've got five people who are working on that and that's just one, one part. So I think it's definitely increased by being at a small, small jurisdiction, but it's also something that I, I really like. I like being able to follow a lot of different projects and have a lot of, have, have a lot on my plate to, to balance. That's, um, yeah, that's not a problem for me. It is a feature. <laughs> awesome. And I know for a lot of folks on this call, they're, they've joined us today because they're interested in getting started in a role like yours. So what's your advice for someone who's just trying to break into this sector or just trying to launch a career in policy analysis? Yeah, so with the government, and I would say like all governments, the hiring process is is slow. Um, and so I, I was kind of... I had applied to my government job and then also applied to Smart Prosperity, got hired by Smart Prosperity, completed my internship with Smart Prosperity all before that same hiring process finished. So it's, I think it's, it's frustrating because obviously people have, uh, you know, have real, real costs. And so the government is not like an easy thing to, to break into. I'd love it for it to be a bit faster, but that anyway, it, that, that is what it is. So I say, um, I would say go into that. If you're interested in getting over in government, go into the application process, knowing that things might take a long time and, and sort of have a, have a plan and keep those just kind of in your back pocket, working on them. The other thing that worked for me was actually being in at the start, it was being in the city that I wanted to work and live in. I think that's less of a, less of a factor now with remote work, but at the time it was really helpful to call people up and go and meet with them and have a tea and kind of ask questions about their job and see if they were hiring, if they knew people, you know, what their job was like. So that was definitely um, a strength. I don't know how realistic that is nowadays. So I would definitely say like, don't be afraid to cold email people and like ask about their positions and get in touch and see. And I just had a 45 minute call with someone who was at a different Yukon government team who wanted to know about the energy branch. And so he just emailed and we just set up a time to kind of talk about what we're working on and, and share like challenges challenges and, and if we had job openings, what, what would we be looking for in, in people? And so I think that's a really good way to, to get the lay of the land and see, and see what type of team you might want to work for. And then the two other things I'll say is like, if there's a job specifically that you're, that you see posted, typically there is some sort of email listed down. I think in the federal government, it's more the HR person and at the government of Yukon, it's the hiring manager. It's the person who that position will be reporting to. Um, and so definitely encourage everyone to email that person to set up a time to chat about the job and see if there's um, any sort of additional insights that can be gleaned because oftentimes that's a, you know, it's a really useful research opportunity um, and think about applying to a job as like a little research quest to figure out, you know, who that team is, what are they working on and why are you a good, a good fit? And then the last thing I'll say is that a lot of times in government, it's easier to hire somebody on a short-term contract than it is to create a new position or figure out a new position. And so that's definitely something if you want to just get in and experience government, you could say to a manager that you're interested in a casual contract and that could help you get, you know, six months, nine months experience, see if you, if you like the team. And then that's definitely something that can help you find that next more, more permanent role. Uh, and so that's also, I would say, common. When I worked for Natural Resources Canada, very common for new grads to do a six-month casual position and then uh, while they were applying, basically, to other more permanent stuff. <laughs> I feel like that ties into the slow hiring process a little bit. <laughs> Mm -hmm. awesome. But it also gives you a good opportunity to see, do you like that team? Where, what are other opportunities and, and get to know and get to know other people? Perfect. Yeah. And I, I just want to echo your point about it being a bit of a, a research mission. I don't know about your experience, but I found it's, 
it's really clear when someone knows a bit about the organization in the in the interview, you know, and when they know a bit about what you work on and there's that excitement about the work, I feel like that really shows through. Like it can be really helpful. Yeah. Mm -hmm, definitely. So I want to open it up to questions from our audience. I have a few more questions. I definitely have more that I want to learn, but I know there are folks on the call who might want some advice or some information about specific questions they're facing or about their own career path. So feel free to put those into the Q&A and also to raise your hand. We do have a question here already from Sabrina. So to touch base on the big break from the beginning, particularly for those who don't have a policy degree or that professional experience, how would you suggest finding opportunities to enter the field or putting yourself in a position for that first break to happen? That's a great question, Sabrina. I would say, so even if, even if you don't have a policy degree, I, I didn't, my background was in environmental science. That was my undergrad degree. So I would say if you're interested in getting into policy, it's helpful to make that connection between whatever you did study and maybe the, the corresponding sort of policy equivalent. So, uh, sort of out of the way example, we, we work on, there's a lot of building codes or energy efficiency equipment standards. And so you can imagine that if you were somebody who had um, a skilled trade experience, or you had worked on a construction site that getting in touch with the policy group that does building standards, that that is not a policy you know, it's not like policy experience, but you've got, you've got some real experience in, in, in that role or that would relate to that, that policy field. So I, but for someone who maybe also doesn't feel like they have like a lot of professional experience, I, I didn't really either. And I, and I think like in a lot of the entry level roles that we have in our branch, so we've got a sort of program officer role, we're looking for somebody who's interested in, in the field and interested in learning more. Maybe they've taken a course. We generally speaking, we do look for a degree, an undergrad degree in a related field, but our related field is, is pretty broad. So we have somebody who applied with like a geography degree and it, it, it's not really energy, but yeah, it's, it, it, that didn't matter. What mattered is that that individual had a really good description about why they were interested in the field, what they were hoping to learn, where they thought they could add value and why they were interested in that space. And so certainly if, um, looking for the jobs that where that learning can be part of the, the role would be, would be useful. So, you know, someone who's trying to break into government who has been, you know, working for a while might find it a bit, a bit challenging where you want to see professional experience related to that policy role. But there's definitely, I think, some starting starting jobs where sort of a willingness to learn is the most important factor. Awesome. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. So I'm going to go to a few more of my questions, but I would encourage everyone to keep putting your questions into the Q&A or to raise your hand if you have any more, you know, burning questions, things you want to find out. If you're looking for any advice, it is a great time to, to ask Heather anything you want to know. What I'm curious about is, you know, so you visited Alaska, you had this really amazing time and you took the jump to go to the Yukon. So what is it, you know, what is unique and what do you think is um, different about working in northern communities, working in the territories? And if someone was thinking about making that move as well, anything that you would tell them, good or bad, pros and cons about making that move? Sure. I just thought of something else for Sabrina. So I'll just go back to the first question and just say, Sabrina, if there's a particular policy opportunity that you're interested in, you should just email the person who has that job or who has that role or who has that is working in that organization that you want to work in and say, hey, I'm interested. I'd love to chat and, and see what they're working on and if they've got job opportunities coming up. And so keep your name at the front of their mind so that when opportunities do come up, they're like, oh, I should get in touch with, with that person who reached out. That would be my, my recommendation as well. Awesome. So about the question about moving up to the north. Yeah, I, I, I think one of the things that made it, like I mentioned, that made it a bit easier was that I already had met a couple of my colleagues. So I got to ask them questions about what it was like and hear a bit more about Whitehorse. 
one of the pieces of advice that they gave me was, you know, are you okay living in a small town? And I had lived for a number of years or a couple, multiple years with engineers of the borders in West Africa in a remote village. And so I was like, yes, can do, that's fine. But that was a really useful thing to sort of know about or, or know kind of what I was, what I was getting into. I think the biggest benefit was figuring out what type of government I wanted to work in. So the territory and the provinces have the sort of, I don't know, have the jurisdiction over energy and environment matters. That's just how it's been delegated in the constitution. And at the time I knew that when I worked for NRCAM, but it seemed pretty, pretty remote. It didn't seem very tangible. I, it, the federal government works in that area too, but in starting to work at the territory level, I just realized how much more um, tangible the, pro the, the things that we were working on. So in my role now, I engage directly with our utilities about, you know, challenges to the grid and work with them to sort of support a uh, uh, resilient, reliable um, energy system, whereas that is something that wouldn't have happened at the federal level because the federal government doesn't quite have, but they've got a different role. So they're working across, across the whole country. And so it just means that the type of work is a bit, is a bit different. So in making this move, it turned out to be a really good fit. I think other people maybe like that more national perspective. And so it would, it wouldn't be, but that was, um, I think a, a beneficial surprise. White Horse also just generally is, is pretty easy compared to a lot of other spots in the north. It's road accessible. It's pretty close to, um, plane flight to Vancouver and Calgary and Edmonton. So it's like, it, it was, it was a really good, it worked out well. Awesome. We have a question here that I think will fit in really well, because I know you have quite a bit of experience with electric vehicles. So uh, this person's wondering what an individual should focus on if they want to become an energy policy analyst in the electric vehicle do domain. So they currently have a master's degree in electrical engineering, but they don't have any prior experience right now as an energy analyst. Mm, that's a that's a good question. I would say I, I guess having experience as an electrical engineer is like is highly relevant. I think the biggest thing that you could demonstrate is your sort of writing ability. I know that I took some classes with engineers in my undergrad and, and definitely there's a focus on sort of the analytical skill set. Often cases that's like missing and is a really good complement to a policy team shop. So they, so a policy team may be very interested in, in having, having you on board as like a technical specialist. Otherwise, I think the, the, the things that you could do to sort of demonstrate that you're a really great fit would be experience researching, writing. If you have writing samples, that would be, that would be good to kind of show, you know, if, if, if you don't have writing samples within your work, you could write some sort of like blog post examples um, about topics in electric vehicles and, and use those as a, as a good judge of your writing ability. And then let's see, I, I, I think Right. The electric vehicle is a bit, I think for a lot of governments, it's, it's a bit niche. So somebody might work on electric vehicles, but unless you're maybe working for the government of Canada, that wouldn't necessarily be your exclusive focus. So if you've got an, an interest, I think there's definitely ways to sort of explore, but maybe think about additional topics that um, are likely to, to come up that are close by electric vehicles. So that could be, you know, grid capacity, challenges of EVs with transmission infrastructure, renewable generation. Th those are also things that whatever team you're, you're working on probably, probably has a focus on as well. And so I mentioned earlier in the talk about, you know, you're working on multiple things. EVs is probably just one of those topics that that group is, is working on. But otherwise, I would also, I don't know, I feel like a bit of a broken record. Um, if there's a team that's working on EVs, get in touch with them and, and chat with them and, uh, and see, what, see what they're also working on and, and how, um, how you could be better positioned to, to join that group. And definitely, definitely reach out and get in touch. So yeah, so I, I work with a couple of engineers right now. It's really great to have them on board, on, on the group. And... Yeah, we have a, have a really good blend of sort of technical experience, but then also sort of policy writing and synthesizing uh, experience and, and both are sort of a good fit for in the energy policy world. Awesome. 
And so I think I just have one last question for you. And if anyone else thinks of anything, feel free to pop it into our Q&A box there. So this one, it can be a bit hard to answer because it does involve talking about some of the cons, but what is your favorite and your least favorite part of your job? <laughs> so my favorite part of the job is, is when you do get to see those big, those big changes. I think one of the, one of the things that I enjoy about policy is your, you're setting sort of really, I don't know, really durable changes. So we started an electric vehicle rebate to almost two years ago, about two and a half, uh, one and a half years ago. And that rebate in Yukon has really driven a change from 14 electric vehicles before the rebate to now like over 130. So like that type of change is really great to see. And, and that's not something that like I could ever accomplish just, just myself, right? Like it's the government, like working for the government that allows you to have that sort of impact and that, and that reach. And we're working on other sorts of legislative changes that when that gets passed, if, if, and when that gets passed, yeah, it just sets like a really strong foundation. So it's cool to be a part of that. I think maybe the, the challenge with working in government is that if you are somebody who's very entrepreneurial and, you know, you're used to kind of taking something and, and running with it getting involved in government, you're, you're going to realize that you are part of this very large network that you have to get on board with you. Um, and so you're not just doing anything in isolation anymore. Um, you know, maybe if you're coming from an academic world where you were devising your own experiments and pitching for funding and then executing and, you know, and speaking of conferences, all of a sudden, you know, you're, you've got a manager and you've got, you know, three layers of, of management that you're reporting to. And there are three other teams that are doing similar things that want to be kept informed about what you're working on. So that being part of the bigger system can also be a bit of a, a bit of an adjustment. I think it's a strength, right? Like it, the, the pro and con are like two sides of, of the same coin. You're part of a bigger thing that can create really powerful change, but, but it is, it is a slow moving multi multiplayer system that you're that you're trying to push along. Yeah. Yeah. I think it definitely happens where you all get an idea and I just want to hit the ground running. And then it's like, oh, no, 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 we should have a meeting. We should talk about it first. And it can feel difficult, but then you get so many good ideas from your team and you realize it, it can be slower and it can be difficult, but it, it's really fun to work with a team and get to have their expertise on board. Mm -hmm. Definitely. Well, okay. Well, thank you so much, Heather, for joining us and for taking the time to share all of this advice. If folks want to get in touch with you, is there, you know, would you encourage LinkedIn or email or what is, do you think is the best way if anyone wanted to reach out? Maybe they're a bit shy to ask their question on the call. Yeah, I would recommend uh, getting in touch with uh, my email so I can put my work email in, in the chat. It's my first name um, and my last name at UConn. Oh, UConn.ca. That, that was a bad autocorrect there, <laughs> but definitely, definitely get in touch. And I'd be happy to offer advice where I can. Awesome. Thanks so much. And I'm going to put the link to our discovery hub in the chat as well. So I encourage folks to check that out for all kinds of resources, networking opportunities, training courses, all kinds of things. So with that, I want to thank everyone for joining us today for your time, for your attention. It's all really greatly appreciated. If you have any connect or any questions, feel free to connect with either of us after the call. Super happy to follow up and keep these conversations going. And one final thank you to our sponsors, Natural Resources Canada and Electricity Human Resources Canada. I did see a hand go up, so I do want to give you a chance. If you did have a question, if you pop that hand back up, I can give you a chance to unmute. Going once, going twice. Okay. <laughs> You might get a question after the call, but uh, thank you, everyone. Have an awesome rest of your day. And thank you again, Heather, for joining us. Thanks, Kristen, for having us. Bye. Bye.